when we were starting, we realized the idea of niching ourselves into doing one thing really well made it really easy for us to sell a story to a client. Hey Hatchings, welcome to the Motion Hatch podcast. I'm your host, Hayley Akins. On today's show, we have Jess Peterson, who's the founder, CEO, and creative producer at Mighty Oak. They're an animation studio specializing in handmade animation. They've worked with awesome clients like Airbnb, Netflix, HBO, and Nick Jr. It was really, really cool to talk to Jess. We talked about the benefits of working with business partners rather than trying to do everything at once. It was a super great episode. I hope you all enjoy it. Hi, Jess. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started? Sure. So there is a long story and a short story, and I'll, I'll get somewhere in the middle. But my background actually is from the music industry. And I was working with bands, putting on events, uh, touring with bands on buses, and then um, decided to make a move from the music industry into working at museums. Um, and so I actually landed a job at the Children's Museum of the Arts in downtown New York as their communications manager and was working with one of my now business partners, Emily Collins, who ran our stop motion department. And she and I would tell stories together uh, to bring events and promotions to families that were coming to our to our museum. And I realized that this was a really great way to tell a story. Uh, so to take a step back a little bit, uh, when I was a young girl, I actually used to perform in a storytelling troupe with my mom, who is a professional storyteller, and uh, which is a pretty nerdy way to go through your teens. But I realized that telling stories was something I really loved to do. So I decided to leave the museum to start my own project. And I was going to be building out brands for women uh, building businesses. And after working through a few iterations of it, I decided the thing I wanted to do was come back to my roots of telling stories. And that's why I decided to hone in on video. And fortunately, the only person I knew doing video at the time was my friend Emily from the museum who was telling stories through stop motion. And so she and I decided to form a partnership and again, had no experience in this space. I had never worked in animation before, but I just knew it was such a cool way to tell a story and would do well on platforms like social media, where a lot of times we're looking at things without sound. And so together, she and I decided we would figure out how to start our own business and had to start basically from the bottom up, building out a portfolio, finding a location, building a team. And so it's kind of been, it feels like it's it's been a long time, but really it's only been about two years that we've kind of combined forces. Uh, But I've learned so much in that space about not just stop motion animation, but also how to run a business in general. So I feel like all of the different facets of my life going from storytelling to music to animation have kind of given me a good perspective on how to um, work with brands in a creative way. Yeah, that's awesome. I was going to ask you about how you guys like brand Mighty Oak because it's so obvious from your site, like what you do and what you're really good at. Was there like a lot of consideration that went into that? I think when Emily and I first sat down together, we we kind of looked to what we liked. You know, there's a lot of ways you can create a brand and you can create a brand that's much bigger than you or the brand can be kind of an extension of your personality. And I think for us, the easiest way to create a brand was to build it from our natural interests. I think especially when we were the ones making it, it felt the most natural. And so we really wanted to create this kind of dreamy dollhouse space, you know, full of color, really bright colors, things that made us happy. And so we started the brand in that way. And then when we brought on our third partner, Michaela Olson, she kind of helped us take it to the next level, you know, bringing in more textures, bulking up some of our our color and font choices. Um, So that was really, honestly, just a big extension of our brains, just where we, where we see ourselves um, in the design world is, right? Colorful. And also our voice too. I mean, one part is how you come off visually, but the other part is the voice that you share in your stories. And I think the three of us are really committed to telling stories that celebrate things that we find important. And so part of our branding is also to decide how we tell stories, whether or not we're going to tell it in a celebratory way, 
we usually do try to find the, th- the positive in, in stories because there's plenty of negative stories out there in media. And so we try to bring that positive voice and bright colors together into every project we tell. Uh, not that every project is a happy story, but we want to see how we can create a thoughtful approach to every piece that we that we collaborate on with clients or even in our own work. Yeah. Do you think that it helps uh, Mighty Oak stand out because you have such a clear brand and you're doing like quite a niche thing? I think so. Well, we hope so. <laughs> that's the goal. We want people to see a piece and go, oh, I think Mighty Oak did that. I think that's a that's a really special thing to be able to say. It certainly can. Niching yourself has pros and cons. And of course, people can look at your work and say, that doesn't feel like it fits us, even though it would be a client that we potentially could do really great work for. And so something we've realized as we've grown is we started in a very niche space and people would come to us for a certain look. But that's also that can start to lose its charm for us too. We want to be able to expand and try new things and experiment as well. So we've started to expand our own brand designs uh, over the years so that we can share different ideas with clients and make sure they know that they can trust us to make a piece that will fit whatever matches their brand for their audience. Obviously, we have our own thoughts, but it doesn't mean that we can't basically you know, match our style with what they want to do. So on your site, you on your about page, I really like that you have like the pictures of you three and then you have kind of some like little stop motion animation bits like coming out of your ears and things like that. Mm. It's very like it seems like you have made a conscious decision to really like push who you are. Do you think that's helpful when building a business? I think yeah, that's actually it's a very good question. Uh, and that those those gifts are actually made by another animator uh, called Irma Fiend on, uh, on social. So you can find her, Emily Roberts. She's amazing. We did make a conscious decision to showcase ourselves. Again, we wanted, we are a boutique studio. We wanted people to know who they were working with. A big part of working with our studio, I do believe comes down to our personalities and who we are, the kind of client services that we offer to our clients that's something that's very important to us. It also has been interesting stepping into the space of animation. Again, I, I came from the music industry where I, where I knew that it was a predominantly male, you know, male supported industry, but I wasn't quite sure about animation. Like, I didn't know anything about it really until I met Emily at the museum. And so once I started talking to more animators, we, I started finding out that it was a predominantly male industry in the animation as well. Not a huge surprise, but so something that we found important on our end was to make sure that female animators knew that there were studios out there like us and that there was a place where they could find opportunities. Um, again, not that we exclude working with men either. We love working with any great designer, but we were interested in making sure people knew that our brand was of an inclusive space, again, run by women who happen to make really great work. So a question about why we have decided to niche ourselves in the animation world to the handmade realm uh, comes up often when we're talking to clients and talking to press, you know, why did we decide to hone in on such a specific area of expertise? And I think for us and for me, especially something that I learned when I was in grad school, I took one media class and we discussed the idea of brand positioning. And there were three rules of thumb when thinking about your positioning that we discussed that I really took to heart. One was, do you want to be seen as, let's say, the, the Walmart of your industry? Meaning you offer everything under the sun for the lowest price possible and your selling point really is your low cost. That's one way to, to approach it. Two is that you become the innovator in your industry, meaning that your, you know, whatever Apple was at the time that the iPod came out, you're the first one, you break the rules, you disrupt the industry and you're the innovator. So people come to you. And while that obviously can be very successful, the copycats do come. And it's, it is very challenging to think through you know, how to be the first in, in a lot of industries. So that one is probably the trickiest market to enter. But the third is niching yourself, how to become an expert in a very specific field that maybe not a lot of other people are specializing in. And so of the three options of brand positioning... I looked to the idea of niching. How do I make something that's so specific that maybe not everyone wants it, but when they do want something, they know who to go to. And so when thinking about animation and how many different directions we could take 
it, especially when we were starting, we realized the idea of niching ourselves into doing one thing really well made it really easy for us to sell a story to a client. So again, not that it is for everyone. And a lot of people are looking for different types of designers, but now we're not competing amongst thousands upon thousands of graphic designers in in New York City alone, forget the country or the world. We're in a very specific class and people know if they need to find someone in this particular space, they know they can come to us. And so we've been pretty fortunate that stop motion is also having a really exciting resurgence and people are looking for this kind of work. So we kind of found the right positioning at the right time for people to say, hey, we need more stop motion. There aren't many studios totally equipped to do it at the scale that we can uh, without going to a huge, huge studio uh, like Leica, for instance. So it's been kind of an interesting space for us to be these past couple of years. That said, yeah, I've mentioned earlier that like anything, our artists and designers don't want to only do one style of work forever. That could get kind of boring. So we're also starting to think about how we expand beyond the handmade space uh, while still making sure that the human touch is in everything we do. And so we have been discussing, you know, moving into video game design or 3D modeling and design. Um, and how can we keep handcrafted effects in these different types of projects? And that for us feels like it still hold, holds our mission, but we don't have to be so explicit to only doing handmade animation. It allows us to tap into other fields, create other products, and still hold true to what we think is really important about handmade animation, which is creating that emotional connection with people through tactile objects. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because I always think it's good to kind of be in more of a niche. And I think a lot of people listening to this are probably mostly like generalist motion designers. And I always think, you know, it's good to kind of think about the clients that you want to work with and decide what they're looking for. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, as well as what you're passionate about and kind of go into that area. So I just think it's really Mm -hmm. interesting about what you were saying and how the brand positioning, you know, you have those three different things. And I know like when you're niching down into an area, you can also niche down by like price as well. I guess that's kind of the same as the brand positioning, the Walmart thing. (laughs) Right, right. Well, it is thinking about your brand. We talk about brand in in terms of colors and and voice, but it it can also come down to, to something even more specific. So they call it a USP or unique selling point in business, but what makes you special? What makes you stand out? That is, I think, the ultimate goal and challenge for creatives in general. You can make amazing work. How do you make sure people understand that it's special? Why you over someone else? And so again, it's a tricky thing to answer when you want to do a lot of different types of work. And so we find that sometimes honing in to start allows people to understand your expertise and then we grow from there. So we wanted people to know our unique selling point was this handcrafted style of animation. It gave people something to talk about, something to remember us for, which made it feel somewhat special. And now when people come to us, our our clients, our loyal clients who work with us on lots of projects, they can say, actually, but could you try your hand at doing this piece? You know, what if we did more 2D instead of doing cut paper or clay? And we can do those things. Now they know us and trust us to to take on more opportunities and, you know, help with more of their needs. So for us, it was about figuring out the part of our brand that made us really unique and special. And that was a big selling point, I think, for us so far. Yeah, I think it's really interesting because you're saying that when you started, you were doing like this handmade stop motion Mm -hmm. stuff, but now you're kind of moving the brand more into, yeah, we do that, but we also can do other things. But our main like USP is you know, having kind of a human touch and that kind of side of it, which makes so much sense to me as like a progression. So I think that's really nice because like you say, it can be difficult if you're doing the same kind of work over and over again, but you're taking what you're really good at and then applying it into other kind of areas or like technical abilities, which I think is awesome. Right. It allows you to grow. And that's something I I saw I was watching some Skillshare class years ago with Seth Godin. Have you, you heard of him before, Seth Godin? Yeah, yeah, famous he's awesome. entrepreneur. Yeah, Seth exactly. Godin. And you know, he talked about first of all, he helped me think about my my name for the business Mighty Oak anyway, because he brought up the idea. While you want a niche in some respects, not defining yourself to one type of work forever. So he talked about 
how Amazon named itself Amazon. Like, what does Amazon mean? It was a river, right? Or it is a river. You know, it doesn't mean the selling of product. It allowed Amazon to start in one space and grow into the the giant that it is today. It didn't behold them to have to stay into whatever industry they originally thought they wanted to be in. And so when I thought about naming the company, I didn't... Thank goodness I didn't name it Mighty Oak Branding or, or some sort of brand name because that's what I thought I wanted to start doing. And then realized as I, as I grew that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to move into another field. So it's been interesting looking at how you can start in a certain place and think this is what I'll do for the rest of my days as a creative. And then realize actually, not only might you be interested in moving into other directions. It may be good for you as a freelancer, as a business. You know, you want to be able to grow in different ways. So while you want to make sure you understand why people come to you and what's special about that, you don't necessarily need to lock yourself into only doing one kind of thing forever. I think some of us feel like we get locked into that space and that's it. But there's opportunities to to grow and change. I think about it for myself. I started in the music industry then I worked in children's art museums and now I'm running an animation studio. If I had locked myself into saying I only do one thing, you know, I may be still stuck in an industry that I'm not happy with. But instead, I've seen myself as a creative who works within the arts and it's allowed me to move into different, different facets that have interested me um, and have made sense for me at that whatever time of life <laughs> it's been. Yeah, that's really interesting. It, it's making me think that you need to kind of be open-minded about opportunities that present themselves, right? Because like you said, you were working at the Children's Museum and then you met Emily there. And then obviously, you know, some people might not have thought, oh, let's start like a stop motion, you know, handmade studio, (laughs) you know, because they weren't kind of open-minded about how their career could change and things like that. So I thought that's really awesome. So there's three partners at Mighty Oak now. Uh, How does each person's role play into how Mighty Oak works? Right. So there's three business partners. And then we also have a full-time staff of two to three people as well. And so the full-time partners are, again, myself. And I am the CEO and creative producer. Emily Collins, who is one of our creative directors. And Michaela Olson, who is our other creative director. Um, And this... I know is actually a different approach than a lot of studios who usually start with having a lot of producers and then hire directors in house. We ended up going in a different direction, which offers us the ability to again just create a lot in house, which is exciting and unique. And I think you know it has allowed us to really dive into that brand identity in a really strong way. And so, as far as who takes on what on the day to day, we're finally getting to a place now where we're not all doing all the things, if that makes sense. Because when you're small, you are doing those sorts of things. Michaela Olson has been... She joined our team at the end of 2015 going into 2016. And she came with more agency experience uh, working as a freelancer with agencies, I think more than Emily and I had. So she's got this great design eye and has really been able to take our our brand into a whole new space. We're actually working on a rebrand right now. And so... What her day-to-day consists of, and besides obviously working on client projects, is really thinking through our social media presence, the marketing visuals, and how we come off visually to clients and you know and other creatives. So she works in that space on the day-to-day. Emily has a background, obviously, working with children at a children's art museum. So she really knows how to pull full groups together, lead... If you can lead five-year-olds through a process of animation, it makes working with a bunch of talented designers, you know, like a breeze. So she is a great director and really leads a lot of our team through projects. She also heads up our internship program that we run um, a few times a year and um, has been helping us really source a lot of new talent to bring on to the team as contractors and designers. So it's really exciting to have both of them you know, playing the wheel in different parts of the creative aspect of our business. And for me, uh, this has actually been an interesting year because I'm also in an MBA program right now. I take classes at night outside of school, and I've been learning how to grow as CEO and creative producer. And what does that mean? So as a producer on the day-to-day, I have been doing everything from hiring staff to connecting clients to projects, producing the, you know, producing each project as it comes, But as a CEO, I'm also running our HR, our operations, the accounting, all the the money and finance. And so figuring out 
how to break that up into different roles is what I'm looking to do now. So we're actually, we've just put out a call to hire a project manager who could help with some of the producing that I've been doing on the day to day so that I can continue to look to the bigger part of the business and how we grow. I think something I would suggest to freelancers who may be trying to figure out how do I do all the things? How do I make the work and run the business and really grow it is, you know, collaboration or representation by an agency might be a really strong way to do it because I think we've all realized it's very hard to grow and do all the things at once. You can't be good at all the things at once and your brain can't possibly tackle that much information. Uh, So you can't be in every place at once either. So I think for us having this partnership and having people tackle different parts of the business has been really helpful. And I know as a freelancer, that can be really challenging. Um, I think having support in one area or another, the thing that, you know, maybe you don't gravitate towards or feel like you just need extra support with is really helpful. Yeah, I think the thing that people struggle with is you kind of, you know, maybe become like quite a successful freelancer. And then you're like, where do we go from here? You know, how do we build our own studios, things like that? And, you know, you kind of, if you do that, you end up becoming like the kind of more organized person you're the the sort of producer and then you're like hiring other animators and things like that to help you Mm -hmm. whereas you know I think it's quite interesting because you're sort of coming from the other side of it and then it's also we mentioned it before on the podcast where you know maybe you could hire someone else to help you with the organizational side of things or that client outreach and things like that where people don't generally think of that they kind of take that role on themselves even if maybe they're not great at it and they are great at being like the artist and that's how they get most of their clients. So I just think it's super interesting. It's really, yeah, I think that that happens to a lot of us, right? Well, I'll just do it all because it'll save money. I'll be able to keep, you know, keep more of the profit. But in truth, I think we've learned by doling out, you know, responsibilities, delegating to others, we grow and also we offer opportunities to other creatives. And I think that creates a really nice, inclusive creative space for all of us. I think you mentioned it too, what, like what you naturally gravitate towards. Like knowing your natural strengths is really helpful. I think that's something the whole team has realized. When the three of us started and we're doing all the work ourselves, I don't know that we all predicted as we grew, we'd have to step out of those, those execution roles and take on bigger direction leadership roles. I think that can be tricky for, especially for creatives to kind of to feel comfortable with, you know, you're so used to making and that's why you got into this industry. And as you grow, you may find there's new opportunities coming up or new things appear where you need to grow into a different space. And I think for someone interested in growing their company, you just need or growing your freelance job, you need to kind of think about what role you want to play in that. Do you actually want to grow it and be the leader of the company and then have people working for you? Do you want to stay in the artistic space? And in that case, do you need support to help tackle the things on the day-to-day that don't interest you or don't feel naturally comfortable? I think that's something that's easier said than done to make that decision. Um, but it is something I think all artists and creatives grapple with as you as you grow. From, you know, And that's a good sign. It means people like what you do. <laughs> but what do you do with that once the demand starts growing? That's what we are, we're all looking at now as, as Mighty Oak grows. So I think it's really interesting what you said about you know, maybe you could get representation if you aren't kind of the person that wants to go out and look for clients, but you know, you do really good work and you're quite successful. I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it rather than people going into kind of more organizational roles and kind of building their own studio out. So I think there are lots of different options out there. And I think it's about trying to think what you want from your life and how you want your business to be and how your business revolves around your life as well as kind of, you know, what you want to do with your career and stuff like that. So I think it's really great to talk about those things. Absolutely. And nothing is forever either. You can start in one place, grow to another place, shrink back to another place, pivot, you know, to another whole industry altogether. I think that is just something people I know talking to other friends who are in the creative industries, people can be very nervous about is, well, what if I want to make a change? What if I don't like this decision? Well, you can change it. And that's okay. I think we worry, well, people see me as this role. We we process and think a lot about how people see us more than other people actually do. Um, and it's kind of hard to say that. It's like, oh, no one really cares if I change from one place to the other. But 
in truth, they look to see where your work is now. As long as you're confidently sharing whatever place you're in and you you feel confident in why you made that change or that pivot, why you've grown, why you're in a different role. I think people are really excited to move with you in that space. I don't think that they question why you've made a decision to continue being an artist, to grow into a director role where you oversee people, to move into a production role. People aren't, aren't uh, scrutinizing it as much as we we might be doing to ourselves. Yeah, I think that's really important. So where do most of your clients come from? We are actually looking into where our clients come from now. I've actually been doing this as part of that MBA class I'm in and laying out, well, how did we actually meet all these people? Where did that come from? I think for us, in a very fortunate way, a lot of it at this point is word of mouth and referral, which is very exciting. We also, we work with a lot of agencies. And I will say the interesting part about agency life is a lot of people move from one agency to the other. And so it's a real reminder to be good and fair to all of your clients because you never know where they end up next. We've worked with some clients at one company who switched to another company and brought us with them. So that's been really exciting and allowed us to grow our client base because we're still working at the, with that other company as well. So now we've got two clients. And so word of mouth and referrals are very helpful for us. Uh, obviously, the work and keeping retained clients is helpful. But we're also putting ourselves out there. We do a lot of work on Instagram, a lot of work on social media. And while we don't have a huge following, I think it's a very committed, again, niched following. And so people who come to see our work really are interested in what we do. So we don't have... There's some people who have a million followers, but almost no engagement. And so that's not the case for us. We have a very niched, committed uh, community of animators and people in the motion graphics space. And so a lot of We'll find a lot of CMOs of companies find us on Instagram and reach out that way. So having a strong social presence has been really helpful for us. We're also doing a lot of speaking engagements. I teach workshops at the Independent Filmmakers uh, Project down in Dumbo. We're speaking at the 99U Conference this year at Lincoln Center in May. We do podcasts like this and we share, you know, kind of what we've learned, how we grow. We talk to other creatives and animators in the industry. And I think just being out there and being present really helps people learn about who we are. And then we hope that the work also speaks for itself. So that's that's kind of how we've been doing it thus far. It really has been a mix of putting ourselves out there and then you know welcoming clients who reach out and ask about projects. There's probably more we should be doing and will continue to do as I start to grow more into a business development space. But we've been pretty fortunate so far. The work has kind of come our way, which is exciting. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you were saying about, you know, doing speaking events and and then like kind of helping teach other people and things like that. I think that's all really great. I think people find it really hard to put themselves out there and, you know, even just sharing their work and things like that. So I think it's right. really good to say that that's what helps you get business, you know, and kind of giving back into the community and, you know, creating space and engagement, like you were saying. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask you about on Instagram, do you yeah. have a particular strategy that you use kind of when you're posting or anything like that? Because it's something that I'm looking into. And I think a lot of people are interested because I've heard a lot of people get clients from Instagram, but then... I think some people don't know about the right way to go about those things. Yeah, we're working on a strategy. <laughs> so so I'll keep you posted. I think what we're really starting to do more of now is just analyze what is actually of interest, what really does well on Instagram, what doesn't, and also putting in a lot of effort. I think we, like many creatives, struggle with trying to make time for social media because we're not just reposting someone else's thing. We're making all of the work ourselves. Either it's a client project or it's original work. And you really do need to have a balance of both. I think people would get a little bored of us if all we did is say, look at this new client project. How about this thing? And look at, we did this. Like, that's interesting enough for people who know us and maybe care that we're working with other clients. But a lot of our fan base, I believe there are people who just want to look at art that's beautiful and you know, speaks to them in other ways. And so again, going back to our brand voice, we think through, well, what what topics would be interesting to the people that we are connected with on social media? Like, why did they come to us? And honestly, why do they care about what we're doing on the day-to-day? I think social media in a lot of ways, some people think is just a way to put out your stuff. Here's what I'm doing today. But it's 
it, it's like, think about a conversation. If you just walked up to someone and started talking at them for hours on end, uh, not asking them any questions, not sharing anything that might be relatable or interesting to them, they would tune out, right? So similarly in social media, we know that we can't just present work that we're doing for clients. We also need to think about what is interesting for our audiences and what engages them and what do they come to us to see and to interact with. So that's part of our strategy, not just for Instagram, but we're thinking about it for Facebook and YouTube and you know across the board. Why should people care about what we're sharing? How do we make that interesting? You know, whether that be behind the scenes videos or emotional gifts where we're sharing things that they can now share. You know, we're trying to figure out the right space um, and the right projects that will will be, you know, making our audience happy. Yeah, I think you're totally right. And that's what people should be thinking about. I think as freelancers, sometimes we don't think of ourselves in a business way like that. Like what are people looking for from you or what can you offer them that, you know, even if it's just making someone's day a bit better because you shared like a funny gif or something like you were saying, right? or like, you know, they're learning something from it. Like, I right. don't think people approach social media in that way. I think they just share, oh, here's my work, here's my work. And they don't kind of, you know, think what is the audience getting from that? So I think that's really cool. Right. And I think it's, you know, another way to look at it too, where it doesn't have to feel so businessy is just that it's another creative challenge. How do you make work that engages with people? You know, how do you take it to that level? It doesn't have to be just so I can engage more followers and increase my Instagram count. It's it's more than that. It's just a creative challenge of how do I sort out a way that reaches an audience in a really on a personal level. So I think it can be seen not just as a business decision, but as a creative position as well. I also wanted to go back to something you mentioned earlier about how sometimes creatives may not feel comfortable, you know, approaching people or speaking about their work or talking about the different things they do. And I know I was mentioning that as a company, we're doing a lot of speaking engagements. And that's something that I do feel comfortable doing. But you don't have to be out there speaking at large events in order to meet clients. Online works really well. Reaching out to the CMO or the creative director of another company via Instagram or YouTube or even LinkedIn and sharing a message about how much you like what they do really works. People love flattery. I love flattery. You know, people want to know that you're engaged and you actually are paying attention to what they do. And so beyond what I mentioned before about doing speaking engagements and having these referrals, a lot of the ways that we also make connections for working clients is also through relationships and friendships. And some of that are relationships that we cultivate online using social media because that is just the way we do things now. It's also because we have all been artists in the industry for a long time. And so our friends move on to other places and we've maintained those relationships. So we had a friend who moved to Netflix and we're able to connect with them. They brought us in for a meeting and that's how we got our Netflix account. But it was... And it, so it feels easy. You go, oh, well, that's because we're friends with this person. But we, we needed... Obviously, our work needed to be good enough for Netflix to be interested in. But it truly can be that easy. Like make friends, keep those friends. Your friends go places. You know, you hope that you're also going to be able to offer them support when they need it. And so I think it doesn't always have to be something as grand as let me teach a workshop or speak at a big event. It can be just on a personal level, these, you know, close relationships that can turn into something greater. Yeah, I think you're right. And that's what I'm always talking about on this podcast about Twitter and things like that. It's about engaging with the people there in different communities online and kind of trying to help each other because, you know, you don't know like further down the line where everybody's going to be at. And, you know, if you kind of help someone in the past and they say, oh yeah, I really like your work. And then they go and work somewhere else or whatever, they'll be like, oh, let's definitely get that person because they were awesome and they're really helpful online or things like that. You know, I really like what you're saying about that, that everybody doesn't have to be like doing big events or speaking and stuff. I mean, that obviously helps, but it's just about connecting with people on a personal level too. I think it's really, really great advice. Yeah, your reputation means a lot in this industry for sure. And so people knowing you as a professional who does great work, comes through, is very solution oriented, is friendly, you know, those count for a whole lot too. People will find you just because you're a great person to work with. Yeah, definitely. I think that's really great. 
On that kind of similar note, uh, you started a group for female creative founders called Hatch, which is great, you know, because we love the name Hatch. That's so. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's exactly. so funny. <laughs> I know. And, um, I thought it was really great because I think you're trying to kind of give back to the community and do something to, you know, highlight women in the industry and things like that. I, I didn't know whether you want to tell us a bit about that project. Sure. So Hatch has actually transformed since it first started. Um, I had started it with a friend, my friend Michelle, in 2014 when I was first getting started in business on my own. This is before Emily and I joined forces. And it really was a very selfish project. It was, of course, I wanted to make friends and connect with others, but I knew I wanted to start something creative and run a business and had no idea how to do it. And so this was a really great way to connect with peers and share our services. So that's how it began. And after a few meetups where we're all sharing ideas back and forth, I realized that maybe I shouldn't be the one leading the charge because I didn't know. That's the blind leading the blind. So I decided to try to bring in guest speakers who had more experience in the field of entrepreneurship. And so we were meeting and listening to female founders who had had a company that was had been around for a few years. They had employees and they could kind of speak to what was working for them, what wasn't. We would talk about specific topics, very similar to this podcast, actually. So ha- the word hatch just has that, <laughs> has that definition, I guess, behind it. As Mighty Oak grew, um, it did become more challenging for me to keep both projects going. And so we actually have taken the idea of hatch and what it means and turned it into a short animated series and have produced two videos about two female founders that we were just really inspired by who had really defied the odds, had fled refugee camps to start multi-million dollar businesses, had recovered from chronic illnesses to make glasses for Beyonce and Rihanna, you know, just like incredible stories of creative founders who may not have been your, you know, what you would see as your typical successful founder had figured out a way through creativity and talent um, and perseverance to really defy the odds and succeed. And so that's we basically tried to combine what we do now as an animated studio with that passion to support women starting businesses. And so that's where Hatch is now. But outside of that, we're also still working on a program to support young girls interested in animation and filmmaking. Um, Emily had started a program at the Children's Museum before we left called Girls Stories, which is still running. And I believe one of their most successful extracurricular groups to date but they support, it's a free program for tween girls interested in filmmaking and comics and animation. And I think we'd like to find more ways to support young girls who are interested in this space, um, girls and those who identify as women as well. We want to engage and encourage the next generation to bring their voices into the storytelling we're doing. Um, We would like a more diverse pool of applicants uh, in animation too. We want to tell stories that appeal to a larger audience. It shouldn't be one type of person telling a story. It's very important to us that we create a more diverse and inclusive space. And so we're working on new programs at the company now that can support, um, again, women who run businesses, but also women in this industry as well. So we're figuring it all out. And welcome uh, welcome the community. If anyone wants to reach out and talk to us about how to do this, <laughs> how to make a stronger community even better, you know, we'd love to talk to people. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Um, Like, you know, we all know there's about, I think there's only like 20% of animators are women. And I just think it's really good just to be doing stuff, even just being visible, like you said before, as kind of women who are running businesses. I think that's really great. And then you're also like going that step further and kind of trying to, you know, create spaces and programs and stuff for people to kind of connect on that level. And what else I wanted to say is I think it was really cool that you were like, oh, I've got a problem. I need help. Let me make something where I can get help, but then also other people can. Like, I think that's fantastic. And I think that's what people could take away from this is that, you know, if they need something, you know, why can't they they be the person to, you know, help create something that will help other people as well? Absolutely. I would say that might be Maybe the only smart thing that I've ever figured out how to do is find people who are better at doing certain things than I am and recognizing talent in others. Certainly Mighty Oak 1.0, 
as I mentioned earlier, it started off as a branding service for women building businesses. But beyond the fact that the way I had set up the model wasn't terribly successful, I'm also just not the best designer. And that was also, as a creative, a very hard thing to say to myself out loud. I've always been creative. As I mentioned, I was telling stories when I was younger. I was writing books. I was working in the music industry. I've always been creative. And I thought in order to be creative, maybe I also had to make all the things. And I realized that's not true. And by surrounding myself with talented makers, like the team I have now, we were able to make better work in general. But I was also able to become a better creative because now my brain can think about bigger ideas that were sometimes held back because I was worried that I wouldn't be able to execute it. Or I was spending so much time trying to figure out how to do something that I couldn't process more ideas. And so looking to people to help me, to collaborate with me, you know, to support our ideas together was probably the smartest thing I've ever done. And again, so for someone who is on the artist side and is a fantastic designer, but maybe challenged by the business day to day, or how do I build a vision that's going to actually grow into something bigger? You know, you don't have to do it all alone. I think that's just the biggest lesson and advice I'd want to give anyone. You shouldn't do it all alone. Collaboration with the right partners, of course, you know, can be a make or break to growth. Yeah. And even if you're just a freelancer, you know, working on your own, you can hire other people and to help you, you know, like I regularly hire other animators and sound designers and things like that. So I think even on that level, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I have to do all the animation, all the sound and everything. And it's like, you don't have to do that. You can do the things that you're good at, you know, even if you don't want to be running like a studio or something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And it, it makes the work better. And it allows you to to have the freedom to take on even more projects because you're not stressing out about doing the whole thing yourself. I think that's, that is definitely key. So I have a question, which I think is kind of interesting off the back of that. Mm -hmm. Has failing at something in the past helped you succeed later on? (laughs) Yes. I think I've, I've made so many mistakes and failed so many times um, that I feel like all my lessons have come from, from messing up. If I'm being honest, I think that is the best. This just seems to be the way I learn. So <laughs> try first, fail first, fix it later um, has been, I guess, a, a mantra for me. But I would say, again, in, in the most relevant case would be the first iteration of this business. I had started Mighty Oak 1.0. I had left the Children's Museum. I had tried working for another company uh, on a trial run that did not work. I decided, okay, I'm going to start my own thing. And I started Mighty Oak as a business, you know, working on building brands for women building businesses. And I finally, in order to do this, I decided this is what I could do because I had this understanding of brand and communications. And I knew a lot of friends who were starting businesses and needed that help. I said, okay, this is obviously a great idea because there's a demand and I can help do it. But in order to figure out how to do it successfully, I realized I needed to create a business plan. And so I actually applied for a business plan competition through the Brooklyn Public Library. And um, this was in 2014, uh, while I was kind of getting things off the ground and, and, you know, freelancing slash running this company. And I laid out, you know, my marketing plan and my vision and the mission. And then I finally got to the projections where I had to write out, okay, well, based on what people are willing to pay me, uh, this is the audience I want to work with. Here's how much they'll pay me. How many projects do I have to do to reach a certain amount of money, you know, to live or to grow. And um, the numbers don't lie. And it was very clear that the people I wanted to help just didn't have the resources or the budgets to really hire me for the customized services I was offering. They definitely needed a templatized, simple to use kind of brand. They were small companies without any financial investment. So why I hadn't thought of that earlier, I don't know. But sitting down and putting that business plan together and laying out all the all the logistics was a really eye-opening moment for me and a really disappointing one. I felt really discouraged. You know, here I was, I had jumped from industry to industry. I had tried this new thing. It didn't feel like it was going to work. And I went home to my parents' house and I sat in my childhood bedroom and I found all these old stories that I used to write from when when I was a young girl doing the storytelling. Um, I used to write stories and teach high school kids how to tell stories. And um, I actually had a bunch of fan mail from the students that I was teaching saying, oh, this is clearly what you're meant to do. And you're, you know, you're such a great writer. You're great at telling stories. And I looked at it and I went, oh, have I been denying 
and ignoring this natural strength that I've had all along. And it became very clear to me that I had. And so I said, I don't want to keep pushing a business that doesn't seem like it's making sense. I want to figure out how to tell stories really well. And that's why when I came back to New York, I ended up getting called in to do a video project. And the only person I knew doing video was Emily, who ran our stop motion department. She and I went to the meeting. It went really well. And I said, actually, maybe this is what we can do. And Emily and I felt the same. And that's how I decided you know, to make a move into doing one thing really well hone my skills, have it complemented by someone else's skills and grow from there. But I don't know that I would have gotten to this particular space, a super niche world of handmade animation if I hadn't gone through a series of trial and error. And then, you know, finally becoming self-aware that, you know, this is maybe a place that I need to revisit and like look to what I'm really naturally doing well, what comes easy to me. So I would say that the mistakes and trials have definitely helped me along the way figure out how to be better at what I do and also be more confident. I'm confident in saying what I'm good at. I'm confident in saying what I'm not good at. It doesn't make me feel uncomfortable anymore to say, oh, well, maybe this is not my strength because I do feel like I know now what I can do well. And that I think is, is a great gift to give yourself is to really think through that. Sometimes we, we forget it because we spend so much time trying to improve things that we're not good at. We go, oh, well, that thing that's that I do easily is because it's easy. Everyone does it that well. And it's not true. It's because you're actually good at it. And so I don't know that I would have recognized any of that if I wasn't making mistakes and failing along the way. So, Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you're saying. And I think the important thing is that like you took stock of what you were doing and then you tried to like improve on that or see opportunities that were coming to you in a different way. And you didn't just kind of keep carrying on on something that wasn't really working for you. I think that's really, really interesting and really great advice for people. Well, I I say often that I think pivoting your career, pivoting your ideas doesn't mean that you've failed. It just means that you're paying attention. And I think successful companies do that all the time. Successful artists do it all the time. You know, musicians have made terrible albums and then have you know, become ama- you know, amazing by their third album in because they were learning from what went well and what didn't um, and finally figured it out. You know, they hit the right time. They found what they were good at and then they, or they found the producer that was going to change it, it all for them. And then that's when things started turning around. So I, I think being comfortable pivoting is a smart thing to do for yourself. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, really good advice. Um, we've got a couple of questions from our Patreon community. So we have one from Mark Boatler. He says, how do you manage your own stories? Do you have a system to set up these self-initiated projects regularly? Oh, our original projects, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what he means. Yes. It's a great question and something that we're looking to create a, a better strategy for. I think when we first started, again, we weren't quite as busy as we are now. So we said, oh, we'll just do it all. And we'll, you know, half the day we'll do this, half the day we'll do that. And then as business increased, we found we had less and less time to work on these original projects. And so that's actually a question I've asked many studios about. And I think what we found is in order to do original projects properly, you kind of need to treat them like they are a client project. You know, maybe not the same timeline. Obviously, they may not have the same budget, but we have decided to invest. We That's part of why you take on client projects is to do your own work. And so we'll decide how much money we can invest into a certain project and what does that mean? And so how many people will we be able to bring on with that um, with that budget? What is the strategy? What are we going to do with it when it's done? And we really do look to treat it like a client project. We didn't always do that, but that's something that we've learned, at least on the big, the big projects. When it comes down to small original content, short GIFs or little videos that we do, that gets planned into a week where we say, okay, we know we're going to be wrapping this kind of project. We'll have you know a little space. We have two or three days where we can make our own stuff. What do we want to do? And so we try to build in time again around client projects when we want to make our own short originals. And then other times we'll bring in support. We'll bring in friends and other animators and designers and say, hey, we really wanted to make a series of videos for the holidays. Like, Why don't you help direct and work with us? And that's a really fun way for us to collaborate with artists and rethink, you know, the style of work we're doing, maybe try new things because it's very experimental. No one's telling you you have to revise it, you know? So um, it's actually a really fun opportunity for us to collaborate with others when doing original projects. But as far as scheduling it and how we do it, we base it around 
the client work or we implement it like it's going to be a client project. Yeah, I think that's really good, like making time for it and even like spending money on it, you know, hiring other people, because I think that's ultimately what brings in more work in the end. Yeah, I think you think through why you're doing it. What does it mean? Um, What priority do you need to put on it? For some of our projects, we've done it because they're fun and we just want to get, we just want to have a a quick release of creativity. And sometimes it's because we want to be able to show a capability that we really believe in. Both creative directors, Emily and Michaela, had projects that they wanted to bring into the studio. So we're working with that. But I do think that planning it out in advance and having a strategy for how to do it makes it less frustrating when you go, oh God, we've been sitting on it. We haven't touched this project in four months. We got to get back into it. And you can start losing that momentum. I think it's helpful to really put into place, well, what's the plan so that you can keep it going? I think that keeps people really engaged and excited about the work. Yeah. So I've got a couple from Megan Spurlock. One is, do you have any tips on convincing clients to invest in something like stop motion as it can sometimes take longer to complete? Yeah, that's a great question. And Probably one of the one of the bigger struggles that we'll have with clients, as I mentioned earlier, the, the pros and cons of niching yourself is that not everyone's going to want what you do. And so I would also advise, you know, if it doesn't make sense for the brand, don't push something if it's not going to make sense for them and bark up the wrong tree. I think we look to clients who have shown interest in wanting to expand the type of work they do in a unique way. And what we try to show is when we talk about you know, the power of animation, especially now using social media, which is where most videos live at this point. Most people are visual learners and um, are looking to at things without sound. Animation is a really great universal language in that way. But one thing that people have found with animation is that when it's only motion graphics or sometimes, you know, just digital, they feel like they may be losing some of the, again, the human emotion, the human touch, not for everything. Of course, there's a lot of 2D uh, or digital graphics that are beautiful and tell a story extremely well. But sometimes people feel like they're missing a little bit of that connection that they get from live action. And so for us, a good selling point is that this kind of melds the two worlds. We can take a topic that might have been really sensitive if you had two humans acting it out and we'll act it out with plants or with, you know, or with cut paper puppets or whatever the case may be. And it still rings true that you're getting that personal connection. It feels like there's a human behind this character, but it's done in a, in a different, a more unique way, a gentle way, a more thoughtful approach. And so for us, it's really trying to walk them through, well, why would you want to tell a story in this way? So for us, a lot of times clients are interested in using animation because they're talking about science or potentially a topic that's really uncomfortable to explain with people, or it could be very expensive to explain with people. And we're offering a way to still keep the emotion and engagement behind it, but using animation to get that message across. So that's that's one way. I mean, honestly, I customize each pitch differently uh, depending on who the client is, because what we're trying to do, again, just like I mentioned with social media, I'm not just trying to spit out, here's what we do, but I want to know why you would want this style of work and how it can be effective and useful for you. So we kind of spin it in a different way every time, depending on who we're talking to. Yeah, I think that kind of partly answers her second question as well, which is, do you have any tips for convincing a client to invest more budget into a project? Right. That is also a great question and the challenge. These are the two challenges. (laughs) How do you convince someone to do (laughs) the work and then to pay you for it? And again, you want to think through who the audience is and also think, so for us, what our price point has shown us is it does limit the type of client that we can work for just as Mighty Oak 1.0, you know, where I was trying to work, do incredibly customized work for people who had almost no money to do the work. It wasn't only not fair for me and all the work I was going to put in, but it's not fair to the individual who's expecting a lot because maybe that $5,000 or $10,000 for that person is you know, all the marketing budget they have for their entire year, you know, they expect a lot from that versus a company who can put that into a small one, you know, one minute explainer video without questioning it. And so I think thinking through who your audience is, is a great start, is what I do the appropriate type of work for this audience that helps to start. And then it's again, just sharing what is the effect of it? Why is this more useful? Why is it more unique? 
what's going to make it special and stand out. Because of course, if someone's putting money into work, they want to know that it's going to help them too. So it's not just saying, well, it's because it's pretty and I like it. What is it going to do for you? And I, I find sometimes asking more questions than telling people is is a helpful route too. Like learning what their needs are and how we can help attend to their needs versus just saying, well, and I'll do it in this style because that's what I want to do. Yeah, I think that's great. It's like you want to be solving a problem, you know, what's the client's problem? And then like you were saying before, maybe stop motion isn't always the answer or... 3D animation or whatever, you know, you have to be aware of that when you're talking to clients, because maybe if you said, you know, oh, you know, it's not quite right for this project, actually, then in the future, they will have more trust in you when they could come back with a project that would be suited to stop motion. Mm -hmm. I think that would work better than kind of trying to force something and then it didn't work later down the line and then you know you've essentially probably lost that client so I think that's really key right yeah for sure cool well thanks so much for coming on the show thanks for having me Haley. this has been fun thanks so much to Jess Peterson for coming on the show it was really really awesome if you enjoyed the show please do share it and please let us know if you have any feedback we're on Twitter and Instagram at Motion Hatch If you like the podcast and it helps you, you can help support the podcast in a number of ways. You can go to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. You can also help support us by going to patreon.com forward slash motion hatch where you can support us financially. And if you choose a $5 a month tier, then you can ask podcast guest questions and you can also take part in our live Q&As that we do over there. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I appreciate you guys. See ya.